we come again to the glory of God in the life of Moses. In particular, the glory of God seen in the angel of death. Solemn topic. Let's pray first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you that angels of mercy and life would have lifted him out of the Garden of Gethsemane, prevented the cross, taken him from the cross, if he had asked, but he never did. As we look at this solemn topic, the angel of death, may we see past Pharaoh, past the Israelites, past the curse and the plague, to your glory. You would have glory. It belongs to you. We pay it back to you and say, we glory in your mercy, goodness, and grace. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The glory of God in the plagues, surprising. The glory of God in the angel of death. The tenth plague of Egypt, the angel of death, passed over any house covered by the blood of the Lamb. At the cross, angels of mercy hovered over the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, leaned, I would venture to say, over the battlements of heaven, waiting for just one word to fall from his lips to bring him divine aid. But that word never came. In fact, it was his silence that caused them all to wonder. And when he did break that silence, it was with no thought of himself. He provided for his mother on one hand and a dying thief on the other. Then at high noon, a high noon that was darker than any midnight, the silence was fractured by a roar from the Lion of Judah, a cry that echoed across the Kidron Valley and right up to the throne of the God in heaven. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A little girl asked her mother, did God really forsake Jesus? Did he really, mommy? Yes, he forsook him, that he might never have to forsake you and me. God cannot look upon sin with any degree of allowance. And when Jesus hung on that cross, he was bearing in his body your sins and mine. He was bearing them away. In fact, the Bible states it even more dramatically than that. He wasn't only bearing our sin away, like with our sins on his back, so to speak, like the scapegoat who carried the sins of Israel out of the camp. He was certainly doing that, but he was also doing something much, much more. The Bible says he was not only bearing our sin, he became our sin. He was not only bearing our sin, he became our sin. Here are the terrible but beautiful words of Scripture. For our sake he made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The angel of God brings us to the first Passover ever celebrated. Over the centuries, that Passover sacrifice has been repeated millions upon millions of times. When King Josiah celebrated the Passover, it's estimated that he slaughtered more than 37,000 sheep. According to the ancient historian Flavius Josephus, several hundred thousand lambs were herded through the streets of Jerusalem every Passover. Several hundred thousand lambs each year. Yet, the blood of all those lambs, those animals, could not atone for us. In the book of Hebrews we read that it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats takes away sin. 
Hebrews 10 and verse 4. Hebrews goes on to say, Christ entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more? If that worked to some extent, how much more will the blood of Christ sanctify through the purification of the flesh, who through his eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God and purify our consciences, not just the purification of ritual cleaning of the flesh, but purify our conscience from dead works to serve a living God. Let us read in at Exodus chapter 12 and verse 8. Exodus chapter 12, verse 8. We're reading from the English Standard Version. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs shall they eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it, its head with its legs and its inner parts. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until morning, you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. You shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, man, beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. I will strike the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt. The blood, that blood, verse 13 says, shall be a sign for you. And when I see the blood, we know these lines so well, when I see the, lot, the blood, I will pass over. I will pass over you. And no plague shall befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The blood was assigned to the people and assigned to God. When the families, particularly the firstborn, looked at that blood, it was assigned to them that a substitute was going to die in place of the firstborn. When God saw that blood sign on the doorframe, it was assigned to him that the household had heeded his warning of death to the firstborn, that they had faith that the blood would shield the family from the angel of death. It was assigned to God. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's in Hebrews 9.22, New Testament, and in Leviticus 17 and 11. Without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness of sins. Verse 21 then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb and take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin. Touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out, of, go out the door of his house until the morning. Here is a brief, brief look. In a few seconds at those Passover preparations on the door. Don't spill! Every single house must be marked with blood. The Israelites mark their doorways with lamb's blood, identifying them as God's people. When Steven Spielberg produced the movie The Prince of Egypt, a film based on the life of Moses, the original script had God saying, quote, when I see the mark upon the doorframe, when I see the mark. However, the religious leaders who were hired to consult and advise, advise the film studio about accuracies objected that this was not specific enough. They insisted that the mark had to be made of blood. 
So that line was changed in the movie too. When I see the blood, it's not just any mark. It's the blood of a perfect lamb. For Yahweh, verse 23, for Yahweh will pass through to strike the Egyptians. So Yahweh himself here is equated with the angel of death. Angel of death would pass over when Yahweh, when Yahweh would pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel of the two doorposts, Yahweh will pass over the door. And not let the destroyer enter your houses to strike you. And at midnight, Yahweh struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who is in the dungeon. All the firstborn, and the firstborn even of the livestock. Here are a few seconds of that scene. The angel of death finds every Israelite house painted with blood and passes over. And Pharaoh rose up, verse 30, in the night. He and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. For there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, Up. Go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go serve Yahweh, as you have said. Take your flocks, take your herds, as you have said, and be gone. And bless me also. Wow, that's surprising. Eh? Be gone and bless me, Pharaoh, also. Really? His request is reminiscent. Could God bless a Pharaoh? Especially this Resistant Pharaoh. That request is reminiscent of a scene in the movie, the play, Fiddler on the Roof, the musical, in which a young Russian Jew asked the town rabbi if there could possibly be a blessing for the czar, the oppressive czar. It's a tough question, because the czar is an awful person. Yet surely God has some kind of blessing for everyone. Rabbi thinks Thinks about it for a moment, and then he says, May the Lord bless the czar and keep him far away from us. <laughs> Not keep him in security, just keep him away. The final words of the Pharaoh to Moses have so much irony, you could pick them up with a magnet. Sorry for the pun. So much irony, you could pick them up with a mag magnet. We often confuse irony with coincidence. Irony is when things mismatch. Coincidence is things matching. Let me illustrate coincidence. Back in 1999, when my son Jeremy was experiencing terrific pain in his abdomen, I suggested we go down to Port Dalhousie and just walk around and maybe just take his mind off it, you know, and feel some fresh air and the distraction. And who should have come along at that very moment but Dr. Miller. When he heard Jeremy's symptoms, he immediately handed off his dog to his wife, Marilyn, and while she escorted their dogs, Amos and Micah, back home, he told us to meet him at his clinic, though this was a weekend and the clinic was normally closed. Within the hour, within the hour, Dr. Miller had examined and diagnosed that Jeremy had colitis, and Alex put Dr. Miller put Jeremy on the fast track to deal with that incidence, that Ill illness. That was a coincidence because Jeremy's illness and Dr. Miller's expertise, they matched. This last scene between Pharaoh, Pharaoh and Moses, it, it's a mismatch to all that Pharaoh has said and done with Moses previously. Here is a man used to being in total, total control. He is posed 
as the god over his world, the awesome, ageless Egyptian empire. That world is about to crumble. Pharaoh's house is rudely awakened in the middle of the night by the voice wailing the loss of a son. It is his own voice. His eldest son is dead. Pharaoh had told Moses he never wanted to see his face again. What irony for him to put in an emergency call to Pharaoh, begging that Moses show up and cancel this plague and move out of Egypt. Especially when Moses had told Pharaoh that one day his officials would come and bow down at his feet and beg them to get out of Egypt. And that's exactly what's happening here. Pharaoh had oppressed the Israelites as slaves, refusing even to recognize the rights an earlier Pharaoh had given them. But here, he doesn't slam them as slaves. He calls them the people of Israel, recognizing their status as a free group, a free nation. That is irony. Pharaoh had refused to let the Israelites worship the God, their God. In fact, he, he said, who is Yahweh that I should obey his voice? I do not know Yahweh. Jews reverence the name Yahweh, and they are hesitant to say it out loud. They would have trembled to hear a Pharaoh spit out God's name. I do not know Yahweh. Sheer irony, then, for him to tell the Israelites to go and serve Yahweh. Not Elohim, not some other name of God, that name he said he refused to recognize. Serve Yahweh as you have said. The word serve is another irony, because the problem all along was Pharaoh insisting that the Israelites had to serve him, not go out into the desert and serve God with their sacrifices. It's ironic as well for Pharaoh to demand that the Israelites leave Egypt. He was not just letting them go, he was ordering them to go. Now this is a strange kind of reference, but Pharaoh's order reminds me of a Dr. Zeus book called Marvin K. Mooney, Will You Please Go Now? On the first page of that book, the narrator says, the time has come, the time is now. Just go, 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 I don't care how. And finally, by the end, the narrator says to Marvin, I said go, and go I meant. The time had come. So the Israelites went. Pharaoh's words are so ironic when he says go, 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 be gone. The man who insisted he would never give in to Moses and to his God is now doing exactly what God wanted him to do. By the tenth plague, Pharaoh was begging Moses to do the very thing that Moses had been asking Pharaoh to do ten times over. Pharaoh was giving Moses everything he demanded. Israel's in unconditional release. God's people could go. Their willed women and children could go. Their flocks and herds could go. And no conditions for the time of their return. There are many pharaohs operating in the world today. Men and women who stand proudly as heads of state. They may be kings and chancellors and presidents and prime ministers, chief executives, heads of mega powers or tiny countries. But almost all of them, wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight, most of them, wise in their own eyes, not needing God. By the way, that verse that says they're wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight, Isaiah 5 and 21, here's the rest of it. Woe. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and shrewd in their own sight. One day, 2,000 years ago, Satan offered all such kingdoms of the world to the Lord Jesus. Again, the devil took him, Matthew 4 and 8, took him to a high mountain, a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. It's not a good sales tactic 
to offer someone something they already have. It's not an ethical sales tactic to offer something you have no right to give. Satan, the trickster, the huckster, is offering Jesus that already belongs to him. Satan offered crumbling kingdoms eroded by time to someone whose kingdom lasts forever. Revelation 11, verses 15 to 18. You might turn there or just listen. Revelation 11, 15 to 18. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and forever. And the twenty-four elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped him, worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and was for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged and for your rewarding of servants, the prophets and saints, those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. British kings believed they ruled by the divine right of kings, the supreme right to rule belongs to the Lord Jesus. The hymn writer puts it like this. You know it. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till moons shall wax and wane no more. To him shall endless prayers be made and princes throng to crown his head. People in realms of every tongue shall dwell on his love with sweetest song. Blessings abound wherever he reigns. The prisoner leaps to loose his chains. The weary find eternal rest, and all the sons of want are blessed. Where he display, displays his healing power, death and the curse are known no more. In him the tribes of Adam boast more blessings than their father lost. We have more blessings in Christ than Adam had before he sinned. Let every cre creature rise and bring peculiar honors to our King. Angels descend with loudest songs again, and earth repeat the loud Amen. This is a resounding and seemingly total defeat of Pharaoh. But Pharaoh will have second thoughts about losing two million slave laborers. He'll have second thoughts. But as my mother used to say to me, when I got uppity and told her, told her, told my mother what I was going to do against her advice, her advice, what I thought, she said, Brian, you've got another think coming. Moses is going to show Pharaoh there's another think coming. God had said, go down, Moses, and Pharaoh is going to say, come back, Moses. And that is going to result in the ultimate defeat of Pharaoh. We have been looking at Moses' life as a story. So, like a good storyteller, may I give you a reader's hook to the next chapter. Because in that chapter, we're going to cross the Red Sea. In fact, let me give it to you as a song. I didn't write it. It was written thousands of years ago. The Bible records it as a song. It's actually Moses' song. His chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down to the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your mercy, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will override, 
overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its full of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. But, huh. You blew with your sword. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, and doing wonder? Now, it's all well and good for us to focus on Pharaoh and see what an impossibly proud king he was. I could say shame, shame to Pharaoh, but that's all well and good until I take that camera and turn it back on me and see how many times I make King me the king in place of the king of kings, the Lord Jesus. My blood might curdle if I switch the focus from zooming in on the monarch of Monaco or present day pontiffs and kings and turn it on myself and realize how many times I say to Jesus, I've made you my savior and my Lord, but I want to take, I want to take it back. I want to hold on to this part of my kingdom. Can I just have this little corner over here? No, he's king of all, or he's not king at all. Let us contrast the way this king of kings came to this earth with the way the kings of the world storm upon the scene. Please enjoy this, par this PowerPoint as we close. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
to the King of Kings. If you make Jesus the King of Kings in your life now, you will have life in his kingdom for all eternity. Let's pray. King of kings, we crown thee now. Lord Jesus, you came so humbly. You came to die. You went not to a throne, but to a cross. And you died for us. And we thank you that because you humbled yourself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross, for that reason, God has highly exalted you even now and set you upon his throne at his right hand that in the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is the monarch, that Jesus is the Lord to the glory, to the glory of God the Father. We pray that if you are, that any of us that are Christians, that we would truly honor Jesus as our King, the King of Kings, and give over all to him and hold nothing back, no corner or crevice in our kingdom. And for those who do not know Jesus as their Savior or their King, may they see that the one who died for them on a cross to save them is coming back as a judge to judge them if they will not close in on his offer of mercy now. May they make him the King of Kings now so that they might be made heirs to the kingdom that reigns eternal and forever, the kingdom of God in heaven, Jesus the Sovereign. We pray these things in his precious name, Jesus, the Lord and the Christ. Amen.